And I explain the science of why we do that as women, we try and cushion the blow, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it would be so nice if you could do blah, 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 because, you know, just no worries in case you can't. It's like, no, that's not what you mean to say, right? You just shared with me, (laughs) you want this thing. Why are we, you know, cushioning it or sandwiching it between passivity? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women, we don't want people to not like us. We don't want to come across as the B word. And we don't want to come across as somebody who is too masculine or too alpha because that further separates us and stigmatizes us away from how quote unquote women are supposed to be. And it's this innate stereotype, I think, and script that a lot of women inherit because that's in older generations, mostly how it was, right? Women didn't have the opinion. They didn't have time to share. And now society is changing. So I think we as women also can empower ourselves to change and be more assertive. And it doesn't mean being mean. It just means being able to stand up for yourself. Welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. You worry, I worry, we all do. If you're paying attention to the world today, there's a lot for women to feel worried and anxious about. As we explore the worries with curiosity and compassion, We learn to live more authentically and unleash the warrior within, someone who is strong, capable, and resilient, come what may. It's time to stop battling against yourself and start using your powers to meet everyday challenges with energy, purpose, and bravery. Now here's your host, Elizabeth Cush. Welcome back to the Woman Warriors podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cush, and I am grateful to have you here today. Things are still a little bit crazy as this recording was made. The coronavirus is not slowing down. In fact, things are, numbers are increasing. So I hope that you're staying safe. I hope that you are taking care of yourselves in this new year. If you want to know more or stay up to date with the podcast, with my offerings for coaching and therapy, get on the newsletter. You can find the newsletter at progressioncounseling.com forward slash Elizabeth's dash newsletter, or you can go to my website, progressioncounseling.com or womanwarriors.com, scroll to the bottom of the page. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you get a free worried women's guide to meditation, as well as mindfulness in everyday life guide also. So you get two free things for signing up for the newsletter, as well as my newsletter, which is amazing because I share mindfulness tips, offerings, as well as updates on the podcast. So today my guest is Talia Bambola. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and life coach in Newport Beach, California. She shares that she is a kind, strong, confident woman who loves helping others discover their best self. And she is a supportive teammate and an advocate. Just like you, she has overcome challenges in her life, and she believes in the value of healing through talking and laughter, and that a life can truly transform because of it. Her passions are increasing assertiveness and confidence in women and teens, as both a therapist, and a coach. Talia is going to share some of her own story about what inspired her to work with women and teens around assertiveness and therapy and confidence. And she's also going to really share how she helps women overcome their fears around setting boundaries and being assertive. Let's get started. Hi, Talia, and welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. Hi. So, Talia, if you would tell the listeners a little bit about you Mm -hmm. and what inspired you to do the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So, my name is Talia Bombola. I am a licensed marriage family therapist, and I'm also known as the confidence coach. Mm -hmm. So, I work with teens and women on building confidence and assertiveness, not only for what they're currently going through. Usually I have clients come in with a particular struggle or issue that they're working through, but it's for life. So they don't have to worry about the skills they're learning going away or not being applicable to a different situation. Mm -hmm. And something that inspired me to do the work that I do was having my own personal therapist from a young age. And I talk about this often in interviews, but she was the most 
influential person that I had to lead the way in order for me to see like, wow, mental health doesn't have to have a stigma. Mm -hmm. And the reason why people often seek therapy is yes, something may be going wrong in their life, but we don't have to wait until it gets bad. (laughs) Like my parents kind of did with me until we seek out therapy. And I think having her as that example throughout all of my you know, early to late adolescence and even early adulthood has just been such a gift. Honestly, I can't think of a better word to describe it. Yeah. It's amazing. I too had a therapist and it was, I guess, high school for me that just shifted. I was really struggling, depressed. I had a lot of stuff going on. And I look back on that experience and think, wow, I'm not sure had I not had her, what might have happened? That's yep. I tell that to myself on almost a daily basis <laughs> because yeah. that topic comes up, right? Being a therapist, I sit with clients for the majority of at least four days a week. Yeah. Um, that's my work week and being able to reference with clients. And I, I use a lot of self-disclosure appropriately. So, but maybe more than most therapists, because I like being human first and yeah. mm-hmm. being able to talk about my own experience or even just referencing, yeah, you know, I've gone through something similar with my therapist and she gave me this advice. So here's kind of advice from two therapists. And they're like, wait, what? You go to therapy? And I'm like, yeah. So she's kind of like your grand therapist. Like it's cool to be able (laughs) to normalize that for clients. Yeah. I love that. Yes. I am very well on the podcast as well as with my clients. I'm very open and honest as well, which I think interestingly, Recently, I've had a few clients talking about how early experiences with therapy were sitting in silence, Mm -hmm. you know, that the therapist would never be the person to either ask a question or begin talking, like it was up Mm -hmm. to you to come in and never offer any personal reflection at all. I can't even imagine had my therapist been that way, what that would experience would have been like to Yeah. Think about therapy in the future. (laughs) Yeah. That would be, I think, so uncomfortable. Now that now I'm thinking of the other therapists I've gone to, you know, because I've moved and stuff throughout the years. I don't think any of us started with silence. I think it started with, I was already telling my life story before we even shut the door (laughs) behind us. And then I was telling it still on the way out. There was no, (laughs) there was the opportunity (laughs) for for silence. silence. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think during sessions, a silent pause can be helpful for people either side to collect their thoughts, but I can only imagine what it's like, like, who's going to break the silence first. It's like, is this a game show or by personal therapy? (laughs) Right. Right. It's like, like, yeah, digging into, uh, yeah, like I'm not going to be the first one, but anyhow, um, so makes me happy that you are a person and a therapist that shares your story. Cause I do Mm -hmm. think that's so important for clients. Yes. to recognize and for the average listener and everyday person who are maybe aren't our clients that we as therapists are very human too that mm-hmm. the struggle can I mean I still am in therapy so mm-hmm. like and that makes me a better therapist yes yeah absolutely I don't think we could do the work that we do with other clients if we aren't continuously working on, our on ourselves stuff. and I think yeah. there's a potential not eh, misconception could be a good word for it that there, like I mentioned earlier, has to be something wrong to go to therapy when in reality it could be like, Hey, my life's going really well. I don't have complaints. It's not this, you know, gloomy, dreary outlook on my life, but I want to know how to keep things going. Like things Mm -hmm. are going really well right now. How do I maintain that? And the more we can shift just, Oh, I mean, I'm glad that we're now shifting mental health is not stigmatized. I think the next wave could be mental health doesn't have to just be for mental illness. It could be for mental wellness. Also, Mm -hmm. we don't have to wait till things get bad. And that's often when, you know, I see couples also, they come in and they're saying, you know, kind of we're on death's door and it's like, well, thank you. Um, This work may be a little harder for me to do considering that we've (laughs) waited so long, but it's not undoable. Right. So it's easier for all parties involved. If we go maybe not like the moment something happens, but if, if we're thinking about it more than one or two days in the week, we should probably reach out and call someone. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, and I think it's interesting that, you know, you said you call yourself the confidence coach, you Mm -hmm. know, that's part of your business as well, Mm -hmm. that it does seem like people are more willing to go to a coach 
for sort of the ongoing yes. well-being or even sometimes, yeah, to, to work through problems that that feels more accessible. Mm-hmm. And I think it's easier, at least what I've noticed, clients are I think clients who work with me in either realm are okay with sharing like, oh, I see so-and-so or I'm seeing a therapist or I'm seeing a coach, but they do, even the clients I have who I do coaching with, I'll hear, you know, overhear some things or they'll be like, oh, you know, and I told my friend, I was talking to my therapist and I'm, I'm like, that's so interesting because they know that we're doing coaching yet they still reference it as therapy. And then I kind of, you know, ask further and they're like, well, it just feels so therapeutic. Like your, your approach is very calming to me. And I feel like we do a lot of, you know, growth oriented. We're not digging into deep stuff, but it just feels like this is my space to just be myself and learn how to be better in society. And I think it's a lot less stigma for people to go to coaching and they feel like they'll be more easily accepted, I think, by other people. Like, oh, I'm seeing a coach. Nobody digs in more. Oh, I'm seeing a therapist. It's like, oh my God, what happened to you? It's like nothing. I just wanted to talk to someone like <laughs> right. who's a good listener and a communicator. Right. Who is not involved in my life other right. than in therapy sessions. <laughs> right. Yes. She's also coming to Thanksgiving just so she could see exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That would be um, something. <laughs> that would that would be that would be quite that would be a great TV show. I gotta say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, yes, indeed. So today, I would love to explore with you some of the work that you do with your clients and your coaching clients about helping women in particular, but teens too, I would imagine, Mm -hmm. in learning how to set healthy boundaries and why that's so, so important and why it's so hard for women. Uh, Yes. My favorite population to work with. I Mm. think it's hard for women because from a young age, we are socialized differently than men are, right? And that's Mm -hmm. on many facets, not just with confidence and assertiveness. Mm -hmm. However, with that difference, it is largely, I think there's a mix that I see with my clients in terms of when people come in, you know, ones who are maybe a little bit more on the aggressive side that need to be honed in and reined in a little bit to be more assertive. And ones are ones that are on the more passive side who didn't have maybe more of that confidence and assertiveness modeled for them or encouraged when they did demonstrate it. So they need more help coming into that assertiveness middle ground. So on Mm -hmm. either direction, I'm able to work with women and teens. I will say I usually see more of the aggression, not physical aggression, but verbal aggression or inability to be calm whilst stating one's needs Mm -hmm. in teens because that's the way the adolescent brain works and hormones are rampant at that age. I don't think you could pay me to go back to be a teenager again. (laughs) And I, with my teens, I use a lot of dialectical behavioral therapy skills because what teen does do really well with emotional regulation or distress tolerance (laughs) or even interpersonal effectiveness, right? Like that those are not skills that were taught. I don't think I learned that until some group therapy in college and classes in college, the one that we were talking about third wave styles of therapy. And I was like, oh, these seem like foundational life skills. Like this just seems helpful regardless of a Uh specific disorder or a diagnosis. And I've applied those skills with the teens that I work with, and it helps them to feel not only internally regulated, their friendships are better, thus their relationship with their parents is better. So I also work with the parents on teaching them how to communicate when they're emotionally activated also. So that's kind of the full circle there with teens and then with adults. I still use the DBT skills to teach them. However, I model with them. So we're doing a little bit more of an interactive approach of tell me your concerns, tell me your fears if you do say what you want to say, right? Or they tell me what they actually want to say. And then we work together to come up with a more assertive approach rather than, you know, aggressive or too passive. And I explain the science of why we do that as women, we try and cushion the blow, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it would be so nice if you could do blah, 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 because, you know, just no worries in case you can't. It's like, no, that's not what you mean to say, right? You just shared with me, (laughs) you want this thing. Why are we, you know, cushioning it or sandwiching it between passivity? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women, we don't want people to not like us. We don't want to come across as the B word and we don't want to come across as somebody who is too masculine or too alpha because that further separates us and stigmatizes us away from 
how quote unquote women are supposed to be. And it's this innate stereotype, I think, and script that a lot of women inherit because that's in older generations, mostly how it was, right? Women yeah. didn't have yeah. the opinion. They didn't have time to share. And now society is changing. So I think we as women also can empower ourselves to change and be more assertive. And it doesn't mean being mean. It just means right. being able to stand up for yourself and doing this in a calm, effective way that isn't too angry. And it also isn't accepting things that are not correct or, or wrong for the person who's practicing this skill. Yeah. What's coming to mind for me uh, that I've been trying to be more aware of in my own communication skills is how often, like if I'm writing an email and mm -hmm. wanting to know information, I'll say, I'm just emailing yes. to say, yes. and I'm like, why, why do I need to have that just like, can I yes. just say I'm emailing you to ask for, or I only wanted yep. to right. sort of like stepping back the power mm -hmm. from the communication to feel more comfortable for me. I'm like, well, you know what? I I'm so I'm working on that myself. It's not an uncommon, and sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. Yeah, I've done the same thing. It'll slip back out every now and then. I'm like, tell you, you don't use the word just. Like, I actually eliminated it from my vocabulary for the <laughs> most part. I think in conversation it comes up, but in emails and netiquette, you know, internet etiquette and general pleasantries, just is a modifier that keeps not just keeps women, keeps people from really expressing what they want mm -hmm. to say because it's cushioning, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, I yeah. just want this. So when somebody reads it, they're like, oh, they only want this small thing. Like it's going to make them more likely to oblige our request. Like right. that's the case. Sometimes I'll look at that. And I'm like, oh, this person could totally use assertiveness training, but here you go. Here's the thing you asked for, like <laughs> learning it, those words. Yeah. But it does make the request feel smaller when right. you add that. But yeah, but if it's important and this is what you need, it's like, why are we yeah. making it smaller? Yeah. So I have people write out what they truly want to say, especially in email. I work with a lot of women in highly alpha male dominated jobs and they're like one of two females mm -hmm. and they got there because they are very assertive and they're go-getters, but deep down they're in a lot of pain because that's how they had to be since they were children to try and get their parents' approval, to try and function in society. To sh like they learned these skills from a very young age and now they got them this amazing job but they're starting to realize like, this is just like eating away at me and I don't mm -hmm. want to feel this pressure. So I work with women on how to be assertive in the workplace and not come across as the B word and not mm -hmm. get called that, you know, behind their back as much as possible because women are learning. We are yeah. learning what to do. We are learning how to function in society. Still, so are men. And I think it's an equal balance that I've worked with men on confidence and assertiveness also. It's not just a uh, gendered coaching that I do, but standardly women are the ones who seek me out either by referral or by Googling and something comes up and they're like, this is the person I want to work with. And we don't work together for life. We're maybe working together for a few months and then they learn all the skills mm -hmm. and the modeling and the practice. And I think part of it is our relationship, our dynamic helps them to realize Oh, I never like I just needed to hear permission from somebody out loud that I could do these things and then have positive reinforcement when I came back the next week that it worked or it didn't work and let's fix it. So right. I think a large right. part of it is that therapeutic or that coaching relationship that sustains the skill building. Yeah, that makes so much sense because especially if you're trying new skills and then mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't work or if it does too, getting the validation of yes, I mm -hmm. did this and it was successful or yeah. this didn't work as well as I wanted. Mm -hmm. Was there something I missed or do I need to do it differently? And even in that, that's modeling them being assertive and asking for what they want and need. So it's almost this like Jedi mm -hmm. mind trick that like they don't even realize <laughs> that even in becoming more assertive. They're becoming more assertive because they're learning <laughs> what yeah. to say and how to ask. And I'm a safe object for them. In my therapy practice, I'm very psychodynamic in my, my work. And I mm -hmm. think that translates even into coaching is my goal with clients that I coach is for them to gain insight also. It may not be the same insight as if somebody's coming in for therapy, but my approach doesn't really change in terms of the goal that I have for clients. I think as deeply as we know ourselves is as deeply as somebody else can know us. And if we know our wants and needs and bonus, we can share that with a person 
and not feel like we're a watered down version of ourselves or our relationships are more authentic. And people often push back and say, well, I'm like, well, what do you mean if you lose a friend or a relationship or this over being your authentic self? Like, isn't that kind of a good thing in the long run because you're not having to fake it or act anymore? And they're kind of like, yeah, I see your point. Like I'll use the skills <laughs> and then they <laughs> practice them. And they're like, you were right. It's so much better to not have to worry about being fake around people. We have enough inauthenticity in today's society. I don't think it needs to start or end with, I mean, it needs to end with us. It doesn't need to start with us. Mm-hmm. But I, I would imagine with assertiveness and you know, creating boundaries that mm-hmm. there is a lot of fear of oh, yeah. hurting others, making people mad at you. Oh yeah. Disappointing yeah. people. Yeah. I, I need to, I'm like, where did you learn that story? I don't know. And it usually stems back to my mom was, or my dad was either mm-hmm. the nicest person on earth. The salt of the earth would give you the shirt off their back. Or yep. my parents were never said they were proud of me, never gave me validation, you know, so I had to, I was people pleasing to do all these things, hoping they would one day say something and they still haven't. And I'm like, then why do you keep doing it still as an adult? And they're like, that's a good question. <laughs> and that's usually their <laughs> homework to, to think about it. And we don't like disappointing people. I don't think most people like the feeling of either being disappointed or potentially disappointing another person. And that's where assertiveness can come into play and setting boundaries is, you know, this is how you treat me. This is how you're allowed to treat me. This is how you're not allowed to treat me. These are my expectations of our relationship, friendship, et cetera. Right. And it's, it's usually a warmer description than those (laughs) words, but sometimes it needs to be that clear. And the people who are on the receiving end also have a say, they have a buy-in, right. When we're setting a boundary and we're asking for something or requesting a request is a request. It doesn't mean the person's going to follow through. We still also need to have kind of a self-care plan in place. And the example I give, especially with couples, when we're setting boundaries and learning how to not disappoint is part of the communication script, asking right for what we want, rather than being upset that whoever we're talking to did not match our unspoken expectations we had of them, (laughs) which we do constantly. But even with dinner, you know, if I'm getting home and I want my partner to cook dinner, it's probably more effective if I say, Hey, I'm running super late at work. I know that you've had a long week. Is there any way you could whip something up with the leftovers in the fridge? If not, I'll pick up a pizza. Sounds way better than me getting home and screaming at him and being (laughs) like, why didn't you cook dinner? He's like, I didn't know you wanted to. And why are we yelling? Right? Like (laughs) it's way easier if we start with, Hey, wondering if you could do this. If not, I will do this. Right. That's a, a way easier communication script to uphold throughout time. Absolutely. Well, and, and as you said that it's, you're making a request, but you're Mm -hmm. also recognizing that that request might not be received positively. I mean, not Mm -hmm. like they're going to yell at you, but like, no, I don't want to cook. Right. Okay. Well then I'll bring a pizza. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you've sort of connected the dots between assertiveness and boundaries, but why is that connection so important? Like, what is it that setting boundaries and being assertive, how are they so, you really can't separate them, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't think separating them is, I mean, it's obviously impossible, but I think it's more chicken or the egg, right? Mm -hmm. When we start to learn how to be effective in our communication, that's where assertiveness comes in. And when we are more assertive and comfortable with that skill, we're more easily able to set boundaries. And if the converse, if we're looking at that and saying, why am I having trouble setting boundaries in my life? I'm such a people pleaser. I feel passive. I don't know why people keep walking all over me, right? Of I'm avoiding Mm -hmm. problems. I don't like conflict. Mm -hmm. Then that lets a person know perhaps assertiveness could be of benefit to you to learn as a skill. So I see it as double-sided coin, I would say, Mm -hmm. that if we're learning assertiveness would be a better skill for us to include in our toolbox, we'll be better at setting boundaries. And if we're noticing, eh, boundaries should probably be something I include in my life, learning assertiveness is going to help you achieve the goal of setting boundaries. Mm, That makes so much sense. For women who struggle with the idea of like understanding that their needs aren't being met. So maybe they're coming to you saying, I feel underappreciated or unacknowledged or not seen in my relationships. 
But for them, the idea of assertiveness, setting boundaries feels so hard. And there can be this negative connotation around, as mm-hmm. you said, the B word for women mm-hmm. that they're the bitch, they're the yep. this, this terrible person for being assertive. How do you help women sort of work toward what works for them in those mm-hmm. relationships in terms of getting their needs met? That's a great question. And I start with asking them where they learned that narrative about themselves, mm-hmm. where their fear is coming from. And that's within coaching and in therapy. Mm-hmm. What is your disaster scenario if you ask for what you want? And also what's the fear behind actually receiving what you want, right? Mm-hmm. So not sometimes for women, it's not the fear of asking. It's the fear of, okay, what if I actually get that? And my entire life changes and who I thought I was is not who I thought I was. Like the, it's kind of a fear spiral that I see some women and it's mm-hmm. not like a breakdown, but it's this step-by-step. Step, okay. If I get what I want, then what does that say about me? That means this is going to have to change. It's like a domino effect, I would say. Mm-hmm. And it starts with learning from who I'm working with. Where do they learn these messages? And again, very psychodynamic. What were your parents like growing up? Were your primary caregivers? What was modeled for you? What do you want to keep from that? And what do you not want to keep from that? And then I fill in whatever skills might be missing Mm -hmm. and whatever validation or appreciation might be missing and then work towards them practicing, asking how to get their needs met, practicing with me, role-playing and coming at it from an approach where I can play almost like devil's advocate for the masculine in their relationship and say, you know, men, again, based on research, men hear things better when you say it this way, or it's easier if you make one request at a time or try to not catch them right after they get home from work, ask them ahead of, right? There's like different ways that we can, we're more likely to have our needs met if we know timing matters a lot in relationships, right? Like Mm. do not ask me for something right when I get home because I need my 20 minutes to decompress. And if you ask me 20 minutes after, great, you're way more likely to get your request matched. But if women are feeling like they're asking at the wrong time, often it almost stops them from wanting to ask again. And Mm. so I normalize, Hey, maybe it's just a timing thing, right? When around, when do you usually make these requests? Oh, this and that. I'm like, well, shoe on the other foot. Would you want requests made of you? If you just got home from whatever situation, they're like, no, I guess you're right. I just felt like I didn't ever have time to see him the rest of the day. And I had to do it right then. I'm like normal. And let's try it this way instead. Right. I normalize what they're going through and -hmm. encourage them maybe including more flexibility and more compromise can be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would imagine just thinking about myself Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's so what I think is intriguing, what you said too, about like, okay, so if I do ask and Mm -hmm. I do, or I do show up in this assertive way, expressing myself, really being authentic, Mm -hmm. then what is that going to mean for my Mm -hmm. life? Right. Are these relationships going to fall away? Are people going to stay with me? Like that can feel scary. Yeah. Very Hmm. scary. Yeah. 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 But so important too, as you said earlier, Mm -hmm. like, wouldn't you rather know that now that Mm -hmm. that there are people that wouldn't support you being your authentic self? Mm -hmm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. (laughs) So if there were resources for women who were just sort of approaching, sort of coming out of this, hearing this conversation saying, okay, I want to explore more about assertiveness and getting to know what I need better. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you would recommend? Yes. So I would say um, I have not read it personally, but I've heard clients have really enjoyed the assertiveness guide for women. I'm not sure who it's by, but I know it's a a book. I think it's an audio book also. And I would recommend that book. And I would also recommend the self-compassion workbook for, and I don't think it's for women, but it's a self-compassion workbook by Kristen Neff. Mm -hmm. And I tell my clients, you know, we're going to meet parts of you along the way that you're not going to like, but it's necessary that you have self-compassion for them because they got you to where you are today, sitting across from me in my office and they learn to have more self-compassion and it makes that fear easier to talk about. And it makes the letting go of who they thought they were easier to go through. And then the last book I would recommend would be uh, Relationship Breakthrough by Chloe Madonis. That is a very, very transformational book. And these are more of the internal 
work in terms of functional communication, highly recommend picking yourself up a copy of a DBT skills workbook and uh, nonviolent communication as a book. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got the DBT skills workbook to help work with clients with mm-hmm. that. That I don't, I have not been trained in dialectical behavior therapy, but it's so much good stuff. Yes, those skills cannot fail a person, I don't think. And if they're not working, then maybe it's a matter of trying them a different way and trying them on a person where you feel right, the confidence, the assertiveness to do so, or at least the confidence to give it a genuine try. And I think so many times people are like, oh, I, I read the resources, but it didn't work. I'm like, okay, let's walk through it. What, what part didn't work. Right. And they're like, well, so I did the thing and I had it all laid out in my head. And then when I got to the person I used just, I watered it down, I cushioned, I this, they <laughs> went back to all their old skills. And I was like, so what you're sharing is the new skills may work, but those old skills are still seeming like the more attractive option. They're like, yeah, I'm like, okay, well then that lets us know. We just have to go back a little bit to the drawing board, work on more of that assertiveness, really memorize those new skills as what you'll use from now on. And then the old skills start to look a lot less. Again, I use the words like attractive versus unattractive option. It's easier for clients to see it that way because they start to like almost be like a magnet towards Mm. the ones that are more effective. And then the old ones that they used are not even effective anymore. So they're not attractive. It's like, I don't even want to use that. It never got me what I wanted. Why would I go back to it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, just that scenario you played out, I Mm -hmm. think is so important for people to realize too, that these patterns are hard to break sometimes because yes they've been so reinforced over the years through ourselves but too through the parenting we receive the caregiving our societal messages mm-hmm. that it does take effort and work and practice yes and it's totally normal if it doesn't work the first time especially for my teens who are living at home with their parents <laughs> yes 90% yes. of the time it's the parents that need the work also right it's not blaming parents it's saying hey you know this is your kid you have a buy in in this and you can't just drop your kid off at my office and be like here fix them and i'm like that's not how this works like no. <laughs> you oh. need to do part of this and you if you want your child to do something else than what they're doing and you notice yourself either doing the same thing or not doing what you want them to do either you mm-hmm. need to start modeling it and that goes for spouses that goes for friends and significant others and all all yeah. of everybody you'll ever relate to in your life it's you know treat others as you'd want to be treated we that starts with us right yeah. we need to model for other people how to treat us we teach other people how to treat us based on how we treat ourselves yeah so yeah. treating ourselves with more kindness compassion but also knowing our boundaries and limits, other people will fall in line. And yes, it's not overnight, but why wait to start the rest of your life if you can learn the skills now? Oh, I hear you. I hear you. I just turned 60 this year and I'm still working on it. So there you go. (laughs) Yeah. It's a lifelong process, I think. And we're different at every age. And, you know, we, we go to bed and we have dreams and we wake up and we're a different person every single day, even if we have a different dream, right? We just learn something new. So each day really can be a fresh start. Absolutely. Such a great, such a great way to end the conversation. So (laughs) Talia, how do people find you if either they're in California or they want to work with you with your coaching? So my Instagram page is mostly memes, (laughs) but there's a real person behind it. That's at therapy with Talia spelled T-A-L-I-A. And then my website is the same. It's therapywithtalia.com. And they can email me through that portal for uh, therapy. And then coaching is just taliabombola.com. Awesome. 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 Well, thank yes. you so, so much thank for you. being this on the amazing. podcast. Well, um, I just, I, well, I love, I love talking to other <laughs> therapists, but also just love talking about growth for women. Yes. It yes. just feels so important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I really, really enjoyed that conversation with Talia. I don't know her. She and I have connected through social media, but today was our first time having an in-depth conversation, and it was so great to connect with her. She's, well, so easy to talk to, and I felt that we just aligned on so many points and experiences for our lives and how important therapy was for both of us early on in shaping who we are as therapists and women and 
being in our life. Again, if you want to know more about this episode, as including all the links to Talia's websites and social media, as well as the books that she recommended, you can go to the show notes at womanwarriors.com. You can also sign up for the newsletter there, scroll to the bottom of the page of each episode or the bottom of the main page and sign up for the newsletter there. Well, I hope that you will work towards setting healthy boundaries, being assertive in your life for the things that you need and you want, and maybe notice when you start using words like just and only and maybe. (laughs) So have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from this woman warrior. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Woman Warriors Podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guest profiles at womanwarriors.com.